In a previous Caspian report released back in 2011, we argued about the likelihood of a civil war in Yemen and that the Iranian-backed Houthi rebellion would trigger a new front in the ongoing Saudi-Iranian Cold War. The other fronts being Syria, Lebanon and Iraq. Now that Yemen is once again on the brink of civil war and facing a Shia-led uprising in the north and an Al-Qaeda-led uprising in the south, all the while being bombed by neighboring Arab states, let's take a step back and look at the origins of the current crisis. Welcome to Caspian Report by me, Shirvan. Yemen has always had an unstable form of government. But ever since the start of the Arab Spring, the situation became more violent than ever before. The origins of the current crisis go back to 2011 when a massive protest movement in the capital of Sana'a demanded an end to the country's political elite. Like most Arab Spring uprisings, it started with good intentions, to reform, to enforce law, to root out corruption, and like most Arab Spring uprisings, the exact opposite unfolded. When Yemeni citizens took to the streets, a dispute ignited between the former president Ali Abdullah Saleh and General Ali Mohsen Al-Ahmar. To be more exact, there was already a long dispute between the two. Basically, Saleh wanted to install his son Ahmed Ali Saleh as the supreme military leader in the country at the cost of Al-Ahmar. So this dispute goes back years and years. But the 2011 uprising marked a point of no return. Both factions mobilized their forces and this led to an internal war within the government of Yemen. The country's military was divided in two factions and over time this division crippled the effectiveness of the military. At the backdrop of the political intrigue, the Al Houthi movement led by Abdul Malik Al Houthi and his tribesmen spread throughout the tribal regions of the country, especially in the Shia majority regions in the north. The divided Yemenite military perceived the Al Houthi rebellion as a nuisance and for the most part just ignored it. In essence, the pro Saleh and pro Al Ahmar forces confronted each other rather than the rebels. This paved the way for Iran to enter the game, since the Al Houthi movement was a Shia related rebellion, and because Yemen bordered Saudi Arabia. It was a geopolitical opportunity for Iran to open a fourth front in the ongoing Saudi Iranian Cold War that is ravaging throughout the region. Since both Iran and Saudi Arabia don't want to openly engage each other in a military campaign, they use proxy groups and third countries as their platform for conflict. So what happened next was that Iran deployed naval vessels in the Gulf of Aden under the pretext of combating piracy, but in reality it was to support the Al Houthi movement with weapons, financial aid and military advisors. As a response, Saudi Arabia started airstrikes against the Al Houthi movement near the border of the countries. Back in the capital Sana'a, President Saleh and General Al Ahmar were still at it. Both sides tried to manipulate the people's uprising in their favor. Then, Saleh tried to assassinate Al Ahmar by giving misinformation to Saudi intelligence regarding Al Houthi targets for an airstrike, which was in truth the HQ of Al Ahmar. Al Ahmar responded by declaring support for the Yemeni uprising and promising the protection of civilians during the protests. The country was on the brink of an all out civil war. So, what happened next was that Saudi Arabia under the pretext of the Gulf Cooperation Council, stepped in and mediated an agreement between the two factions. Now, Saudi Arabia wasn't concerned about Yemen as much as it was concerned about the spread of pro-Iranian proxies and thus Rijad needed a stable government in Sana'a. 
So the Saudis arranged an agreement that would ensure the resignation of President Saleh from office, but at the last minute, Saleh refused to sign the agreement. This led to renewed protests throughout the country and shortly after, in June 2011, multiple C4 charges were ignited in a mosque where the president and major members of his government were praying. Four of his bodyguards died and Salah suffered from burns on about 40% of his body, but he survived. Due to Salah's severe injuries, Vice President Abd Rabu Mansour Hadi was appointed acting president. Several months later, in November 2011, Saleh signed the Saudi agreement, which he had previously refused to do so. The agreement was that Saleh was to step down in favor of the vice president. In early 2012, Hadi assumed the office of presidency of Yemen, and by the end of the year, he relieved General Al Ahmar from his military position. President Hadi was immediately engaged in his attempt to stabilize the country and restore order. He started to reorganize the military and the government, but in doing so it created a lot of confusion and anarchy. By this time the Shia-based Al Houthi tribal uprising had spread and transformed itself in a unified tribal militia under the leadership of Abdul Malik Al Houthi. This was mostly accomplished thanks to the Iranian weapons and military advisors. But at the same time, the Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula took advantage of the anarchy that reigned throughout the country and intensified their own operations. Within a short span of time, the Al-Qaeda faction controlled vast territories in the south of the country. So in early 2013 the situation in Yemen was as following. Al Houthi rebels controlled the territories in north of the country, whilst Al Qaeda controlled the territories in the south. And President Hadi's efforts to reorganize the military led to disputes within the armed forces and the resumption of an internal political conflict. Once more, the military was divided and the generals were mostly fighting amongst themselves. President Hadi, realizing how divided the country was along sectarian and political lines, opted for a new system. The idea was to reorganize the country into a federal government of six provinces and thus ensuring a balance of power among the various factions. But in a resource and capital poor country as Yemen, Every tribe argued for greater autonomy and for more resources and revenues, so establishing a proper balance became extremely difficult. But the biggest obstacle to this new system was that the Al Houthi movement, who represented the Shia community, which made up approximately 35 to 40 percent of the population of Yemen, the Al Houthi movement didn't want to become just one of the six provinces, since they represented such a large portion of the Yemenite society. Abdul Malik argued that his faction was entitled to more power within the new governmental system, and since the talks were going nowhere, the rebels decided to take what is theirs by force. So in July 2014, the Al Houthi rebels stepped up their military campaign against the government, and since the Yemenite military was divided and stretched thinly throughout the country and fighting Al Qaeda in the south, there was really nothing to stop the Al Houthis from sieging the capital, and that is exactly what happened a month later in August 2014. President Hadi tried to delay the siege by transferring his limited military forces to the capital and thus abandoning the southern countryside to the Al-Qaeda troops. By exploiting the absence of the military, Al-Qaeda made vast territorial gains in southern Yemen in a very short span of time. Back in the capital, the Houthis were sieging the governmental offices, but unlike what most people believe, the Al-Houthis and their leader Abdul Malik do not want to govern Yemen. 
Governing a country so divided would only weaken the Al Houthi movement and drain their manpower and financial resources. Instead, the rebels forced the Yemeni government to engage in UN brokered peace talks. And in November 2014, from the peace talks, the rebel movement gained a greater role within the government and even greater local autonomy. This agreement prevented an all-out civil war and ensured the government's survival, but at the same time, it rendered the country incapable of any political or economic reforms. Despite the agreement, President Hadi was still determined to prevent the rise of a single dominated faction within the new federal system and thus put forth the country's chief of staff, Ahmad Awad bin Mubarak, as a candidate for prime minister. The Al Houthi faction rejected the candidacy of Mubarak due to his close links to the president Hadi. And so, in January 2015, Mubarak was kidnapped, and the Al Houthi rebels opposed the new charter of the constitution and wanted a man of their choosing to assume the office of prime minister. Later that month, President Hadi and his cabinet finally gave up and resigned. The Al Houthi rebels stormed the presidential palace and placed former President Hadi under house arrest. But in the month of February, Hadi escaped to the port town of Aden in the south of the country and from there fled to Saudi Arabia. Presumably, he arranged a deal with the Saudi leadership. Right now, the situation with Yemen and the Al Houthi somewhat resembles the situation with Lebanon and Hezbollah. Basically, it's a pro-Iranian faction that dominates a divided and federalized government. Alarmed by the similarities with Lebanon and Hezbollah, Saudi Arabia, in support of Hadi, launched Operation Decisive Storm, in which the Saudi leadership aims to cripple the Al Houthi rebellion and limit any kind of Iranian influence in the Arabian Peninsula. The purpose behind the airstrikes is not to destroy the rebels, the movement has already too much influence in the country. Rather, the airstrikes are meant to force Abdul Malik to return to the peace talks and make certain political concessions in the balance of power sharing within the new federal system. But the longer the airstrikes continue and the more diplomatic isolated the rebels get, the stronger the relations get between the Al Houthis and Iran. And at the same time, the longer the airstrikes continue, the stronger and more influential Al Qaeda gets in the country. In many ways, it's Syria all over. So, what started out as a family dispute changed into a political conflict for power amongst the elite of the country, which in the long term divided the military and ensured the rise of Al Qaeda in the south and the Al Houthi in the north. And as the years went by, the conflict grew into a geopolitical front between Iran and Saudi Arabia. This was a Caspian Report by me, Shirvan. Thank you for watching, take care, and so.